Could you come sing that song again? No. I'll sing with you. Some beautiful word this morning in your praise. A couple of new songs just singing about the name of Jesus Christ. I heard you can't go wrong doing that. Lifting up the name of Jesus, even scripture reading from Revelation. Oh, one day we'll join them. And they'll be singing and we'll be singing and they're singing. And uh, that'll be a day. Go to Luke chapter number one. It's 4th of July weekend. And uh, as Dwayne mentioned, uh, we celebrate every Sunday. It's the first day of the week. It's uh, Resurrection Sunday every Sunday. And they ran down the first day of the week and they went into the grave and, Jesus, where are you? He is not here. And of course, we know that the first day of the week is our celebration time to make hope known. We get around the Word of God and uh, we rally a little bit, giving Him glory and honor and worship unto the Lord. And then we walk out and say, God, continue to work on me all week long. That was just a, a few minutes to, to give me a little bit of an inspiration, a little bit of a kick. And it is good to be together with all of you on this Sunday before uh, Fourth of July weekend. Uh, anybody, uh, any accidents yet? Everybody's got fingers. Everybody showed good fingers and all that. I know that there was some fireworks last night. And uh, I know a few people hung out here in the parking lot. A lot of people love using this parking lot. And it's a great spot. It's good being a, a good neighbor for the city of Blue Springs. And everything's still standing. I don't think that there's any holes in any of the outdoor restrooms out there, so I think we're going to be fine, but uh, so very thankful for people being honorable and respectful and, and using our property. God, this is God's place, and I'm uh, very, very thankful for, uh, for people being able to come up here and park and stuff, and I think there were some strategically placed firearms here guarding the place, but I won't say that. Uh, public, oh, I just did. It's on a recording, but that's okay, but uh, very thankful let me do this. I don't do it all the time, but uh, I like to do this every once in a while, and this is a holiday weekend, and, and it uh, reflects, of course, the battle, uh, the warriors, the soldiers that went to battle for us. Uh, um, do you realize that it's almost 250 years? Think, just, just sit back for a minute. Just, I know all you guys, numbers, oh, uh, it's not that hard. 1776, 250, 2026. That will be 250 years of our country. But of course, as we're going to get into the Word of God today, we're going to talk about a soldier. Uh, I'm going to kind of tie that together with talking of the birth of John the Baptizer, John the Baptist. But with that being said, any of you who have served in the military or are currently serving Please stay seated. Those of you who are not, please stand and give them a standing ovation and say thank you for serving, for being part of our military, for being the ones that have served over all the years. Thank you so very much. We don't have anybody that was in the revolution, well, maybe... but I'm very thankful. I was born in a country that allowed me to freely hear about Jesus Christ. Forty years ago, Bobby, this July. In two Sundays of the week, 40 years, I came to know Jesus Christ. And freely for someone to be able to tell me how to get saved I remember the first person who opened up a gospel track, Chris Bando, in Winterball, telling me, and I know, what is this pamphlet stuff? And uh, months and months later, seven, eight months later, came to know Jesus. And I'm thankful. Thankful and thankful, so thankful. And then I met this guy, Bobby Bonner. And all he ever wanted to do was go to Raiders of the Lost Ark. True. Dollar movies. We were. There you go. And then we'd have Bible study after. I, no, we did. We did. We had Bible study after. But I remember in July of of 1983, after coming to know the Lord on the on the road trips, 
I no longer was doing other things. I would go to a room or those guys would come to my room and we would study the Bible together and we didn't have a clue what we were doing. And we'd all look at each other and go, that sounds good. And uh, we were answering questions like why people in other parts of the world don't have a chance to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was one we always used to, but uh, I come all back to say that I'm thankful that this country has allowed Jesus Christ to be proclaimed freely. And so we need to be warriors and soldiers for the cause of Christ. I thank the Lord God that we can sing about the name of Jesus Christ. And so thank you, God. <clears throat> well, the quick thing that leads to, and this will be at the end of our message, we'll come up and tie this together uh, with a time of prayer and in our invitation. There's a lot of little bracelets up here. They're paper bracelets. And uh, I encourage you to come up and get one or two. There was only a few of them, so I think maybe they doubled up on us. But these are the names of the young men and women that are going to prime summer camp. And we have been doing this for a number of years when Josh became the youth pastor and a couple others before him. Hey, if we wrote the names down of all the students on a little one of those paper bracelets, you think maybe we could grab, have people in the church grab them and pray and so here they are. They're out here for you. We're going to have a time of prayer at the end of service. And, and then I'd, I just encourage you all, even if you don't come up for a pr time of prayer over our young people and maybe some future soldiers, that you would grab a couple of them maybe. Now that there's so many here, one or two, just grab a couple. And you don't have to look for a particular name. Just grab that name and maybe be somebody you don't know. And, uh, and the neat part is that if you are a parent of a child uh, that's going to camp and you planned on not praying for them, maybe you can grab your kid's name. Just, just kidding. Just kidding. But you can grab somebody else's, pray for someone else. And I know you'll be praying, of course, for your own children. And uh, over many, many years, I've uh, been to so many different camps over many, many years, and I'm so thankful to the Lord for all that he has done. And... Uh, Heather Hay broke me into my first camp. Way to go, Heather. Junior high camp, carrying luggage, and you, Brownie, can you carry my luggage? Yeah. I know, you, I think the luggage was like 80 pounds and you only weighed like 90 or something like that, and so I had no problem doing that. But sweet times and, and life-changing times over the years. Remember baptizing you in a pool? It wouldn't have here. Never forget it. Got in a lot of trouble, but that was okay. It was worth it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And five other men got, got baptized that day. Salvations. You coming down to preach camp years ago, having a heart attack, as usual. But <laughs> it's normal, right? <laughs> Preaching Bobby heart attack. It, it, there's like, it's like that name game. It, it all comes together. But seeing people's hearts changed and seeing lives changed over all the years. And so we pray again and we keep on praying. Pray for our youth pastor and his family. Pray for the youth leaders, the servant team. They'll have 16 people going down. They're taking down a, uh, a lifeguard this year. Pray for the lifeguard that they can guard life. No. <laughs> right, Houston's? There you go. But it's a big week. Every week's a big week. But it's good to gather with you. We're going to have a little short Bible study this morning going into Luke chapter number one, and we're going to tie it together to this weekend and look at the birth of John the Baptist. So let me just ask you a question. I like asking a couple of them, <clears throat> and I'll tie it really into a statement, then a question. There is so much hope and aspiration about the potential of a little person's life when he or she is born, and, and then all of a sudden they're going to their first summer camp. It's kind of funny that way. And then they're, they're going to high school, and then they're going to college. and then, but, but when that little baby is born, that little person's life, we're going to look at John being born. He'll be eight days old. And, of course, there's the, the rite of uh, circumcision, which is, of course, the token of covenant that God instructed Abraham in Genesis 17. And you see all that's going to go on in here, but there's so much hope and aspiration about the potential of a little person's life when he or she is born. Hope 
is very simply an optimistic state of mind based on an expectation of positive outcomes. Make hope known. You come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, your hope is now real and true. He makes hope real. And you consider that when you have a child and you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're praying for that child, that they first of all would come to know Jesus as Savior like you do, mom and dad, grandma and grandpa. You have aspirations. You, you hope that they will achieve something. The word aspiration simply means an ambition of achieving something. So, there is so much hope. There is so much aspiration about the potential of a young child when they are born So then the question is this, what are the traits, tying it together to John, that we admire the most about this prophesied prophet? He is prophesied about, and he is a prophet, and he is a preacher, and he is the one that preaches the preparation for the Lord to come because the people are prepared for the Lord to come. In fact, let's just... Let's just read the scripture and kind of get some traits that we would love to pull out of. It's up on the screen. It's in Luke chapter number one. We looked at this about three or four weeks ago. It says, And thou thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. This is the angel Gabriel who's appeared to Zacharias the priest. Where does he appear to him? But in the place where he is, in the temple, he is burning incense He is the one at the altar, and there's Gabriel, appears at the right side of the altar standing. That could be a little crazy. At the right side, a picture of, of course, the intercessory power of Jesus Christ, who in 30-something years is going to go to heaven and be sitting at the right hand of the Father, and there will be no need for any more intercessors, because Jesus will be the last one. But for now, Gabriel is interceding on behalf of God, holy God, coming to the priest Zechariah and saying, hey, you're going to have joy and gladness. Many are going to rejoice at John's birth. Verse 15, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall turn to the Lord their God. Verse 17, here's a prophetical statement of who John's going to be. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. He's going to make ready a people that are prepared for the Lord because for 400 years they haven't heard anything from God. The last time Malachi spoke of, he spoke of, This one that's going to come and he's going to be the prophet that will speak of the Lord, Malachi 3.1. He's going to speak of, Malachi does, of this prophet that's going to be like Elijah. And so this prophet is like Elijah and Jesus even proclaims him to be greater than the prophet Elijah. You see, there's a lot of neat traits about John. There's a lot of neat things that we can say about him. And you even find it from that passage of Scripture that he will be great in the Lord, that he will, of course, preach, that he will not be drunken with anything other than the Holy Spirit, which is going to fill him. And, of course, he will turn people to the Lord because of their sin and because of who the Lord is to him. He's going to make people ready. You see, John was a preacher, a prophet, and a soldier. He was a common warrior who championed the cause of Christ, tying it together to this weekend. You can look at many things about John, again, being filled with the words. He's called great. The words of the Lord, he is again a prophet and a preacher. But today I just want you to see the soldier side of him, the warrior side of him. I would say that every warrior is a soldier, but not every soldier is a warrior. To war over something, to go to war over the things that are right, to be a soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know many of you would think about a couple of old hymns. I was looking some of them. Um, Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. A lot of you know that one, right? A lot of you remember that. 
Maybe some of you remember this old hymn, Am I a Soldier of the Cross? Have any of you heard that one? 300 years ago it was written, 1721. It goes a little bit like this. To think about John who was a preacher and a prophet and a soldier. Are we like this? Here's how Isaac Watts wrote this, 1721. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies or flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend to grace to help me on to God? Sure, I must fight. If I would reign, increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. This is powerful words. I have to ask myself, am I a soldier of the cross? Am I a soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ like John is? It says in 2 Timothy chapter number 2, many of you familiar with this passage, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life. The wars of this life are not the important ones. The warring for the Lord Jesus Christ, when you're entangled with the affairs of this life, get in the way of being a soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ where you're just simply warring for the gospel. You're warring for the name of Jesus Christ. You're standing up for him. And though those affairs of this life will get in there a little bit, they should not overtake us and entangle us. As that passage continues, it says that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. From the very moment of conception the bible teaches us that elizabeth was carrying a soldier she was carrying a man who warred and championed the cause of the lord jesus christ paul the apostle was the same way he even stated in the first corinthians 16 watch ye stand fast in the faith quit ye quit you like men be strong what does it mean quit you like men hey don't give up the fight very simply, it says, do not flinch when you're in the fight. Quit ye. Quit you like men and be strong. You see, that's John the Baptist. That's what our text is going to talk about today. Those that are soldiers and warriors of the Lord, they are dedicated, they are strong, they are durable, they are deliberate in their actions, and they mark their actions, and they're saying, hey, I'm determined to follow the Lord. You see, very simply, the two mothers, Elizabeth and Mary, they gave birth to two life-changing messengers. Please be reminded that these two life-changing messengers, they warred to bring God's salvation because it was such a battle of the time. There was Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians. There was councils. There was the religious geniuses of the day that said, no, that he's not the Messiah when Jesus came as the Messiah that God had promised him. And as we see in the text today, when we hear Zechariah proclaiming, blessing God and his benediction of blessing, just as Mary sung in the magnifying the Lord, the Magnificent, and when you hear that, when you hear Elizabeth proclaim the words of Mary, why would the mother of the Lord come visit me? It's every one of these people saying, hey, we're just simply the messengers of God warring for the salvation that God is bringing in Jesus Christ. Are we doing that today? Our invitation time will be very simply, hey, with all these young people going off to camp, maybe 12 or 13 or 14 years ago, there was a John the Baptist that was born that was to be a warrior and a soldier, and they've kind of not quite there yet. And maybe at this summer camp, They'll say, Pastor Josh, I want to be a soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you show me how to be that way? I mean, I like playing ball, and I like studying. I like music. I like all those things. I love all that stuff, and that's good, but I really would like to be a soldier of the cross. i like to be a soldier like John the Baptist. Thus, our title today, A Soldier is Born. 
What would it be like if one of those little babies that is born this year, you have so many young ladies that are pregnant and the year before and the year before, there's babies everywhere. Right, Kayla? There's babies everywhere. There's babies all over the place. Pam came to me a few weeks ago and says, I need your office for the nursery. I said, okay, okay, I'm out. It's no problem. But what if? There's that little child that's born, and God says, I want you to be a missionary. I want you to be my soldier. I want you to be like John. Let's look at our scripture today. I'm going to read the first few verses, first nine or ten, make a couple comments about the way that the visitors, the neighbors and cousins react to this time where John is being circumcised and being named. And then we'll look at the proclamation, the blessing of Zacharias and kind of look at this as two halves of a simple message, really proclaiming what it means for each one of us to be a soldier like John was a soldier. Start, I mean, uh, read with me, verse number 57, follow along. Here we go. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. May I take the liberty to read verse number 56 real quick. And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. I know in the scripture it doesn't state there that Mary was there for the birth, but there's I don't know, I like to think there's probably a good chance that she stayed that long. But I'm not reading into Scripture. I'm just reading what says there, and it's, that's her cousin. You wonder in the birth here. But her full time comes, she delivers, she brought forth a son. Verse number 58, we transport to eight days later. And her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. She's older in age, she was barren, so they are proclaim they're happy for her that God showed mercy. Verse 59. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. And they called him Zacharias after the name of his father. That would be normal, correct? And his mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. So they're using sign language to have Zecharias weigh in. He's the dad. Hey, mom says no. What do you say, dad? You're a priest, you know. The dad has that responsibility. In with mom. Let's name the name. What, is, what happens here is pretty awesome. Verse number 63 and he asked for a writing table. Now, you know that's basically an iPad, right? Anyway, thought I'd try it. It didn't go over well, I know. He gets a tablet, right? And he wrote saying, his name is John, and they marveled all. So just think of the audience now. Some things really go on here that are pretty incredible with the audience. Their neighbors and cousins. And his mouth was opened immediately, verse 64, and his tongue loosed, and he spake and praised God. And fear came on all that dwelt round about them. And all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. Now, Lord, we've already spent a little time interacting and, and talking over this young man named John. Thank you, holy God, for your perfect word, and thank you for how you have laid out the prophecy and the promises, and now we look to your word to then make, beyond the historical and doctrinal stuff, personal application. I pray in the name of Jesus for every person that's hearing your word that you will teach all of them as only you can by the Holy Spirit. You've instructed me to do that which you've called me to do. I pray, please God, just go beyond all of that and just make this happen in a way that, again, every time it's supernatural teaching from on high. Thank you for this scripture. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for your perfect word we delve into it in the name of the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Amen. 
Think about this real quick. Gospel of Luke, simply put, has so much personal stuff. You're not surprised. We've had three or four messages already. Luke has a way of bringing in relationships and personal stuff. He just, you know it. Think of the first three verses of the chapter. Chapter number one, verse number one, two, three, and four. Luke shows you, writes for you by the inspiration of God, how his approach is to this. He's saying there's a declaration that he's making of the things which are most surely, most surely believed among us. So all you as believers, I'm one of you. I'm one of those. I'm a doctor who's a Gentile, is converted to the Lord. He says in verse number two, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. He went and spoke to eyewitnesses of all this stuff. How in the world did he have an accounting of everything? I know it's the Lord. I know. I know it's the Spirit of God. I understand the inspiration of God. But here he's making a statement. Verse number three, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Hey, another person that needs to hear about this stuff that happened, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things. Eyewitnesses, people. He went to them. He talked to them. He found out what's going on. And of course, again, God's word is perfect. And he's writing things down. How in the world did he know about how Elizabeth is and how Zechariah is and how Mary is, Angel Gabriel, all that? Well, the Bible says that he went and talked to some witnesses. Besides the fact, of course, that he's God's anointed man writing the word of God, and it's God's word. I say that to say that each gospel has its personality, Right? John's gospel, Luke's gospel, Matthew's and Mark's, and this personality that you have from the gospel of St. Luke's, Luke, you really realize that he's very personal. He's got some detail. And of course, as he's mentioning prophecy and he's mentioning things that are fulfilled, he knows the Bible. And of course, he's given an accounting of Zechariah, who knows the Old Testament too. It's kind of cool. You see, today I just want to give you two simple things here. It's the first half, and then the second half, I'll give you some simple things to put together over this whole passage. So, a couple of things real quick in reference to, again, the crowd, the neighbors, the cousins that are all here in these first few verses. First thing, a soldier is born, dot, 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 the dedication of God's man, John, Revealed the prophetic fulfillment of God's perfect plan. Now, see, we've stated that for a couple of messages. We stated that when we had Mary and Elizabeth last week visiting. It's part of God's way for those that are standing there visiting, being part of it, to know that this is a prophetic fulfillment of God's perfect plan. Aren't you glad? That every time people try to trip up God and what he said and what he did or didn't do, they cannot prove God wrong. Aren't you glad that you can open up the Bible and go, God said that. He promised to do that. Don't twist God's words. God said he was going to do that. God said that he was going to do that. And he did it. So now you're sitting here looking at the word of God and you're going, did this really happen? I believe every single word of it. And I believe that God put everything down here for a purpose and a reason. So he's saying, hey, Elizabeth, hey, you you came to full time. That's why I'm saying, I don't know if Mary was there because it doesn't say that it's there. There's a good possibility she is, but there's a good possibility she isn't. But it says in the Bible that her neighbors and her cousins, they had great mercy on her because she was older and he had a baby. And then it says there in verse number 59... At the eighth day, the circumcision comes, Zechariah is quiet, so they give the name of the baby Zechariah because, again, again, it's part of the covenant of God with Abraham back in Genesis 17. You can go check it out. And the circumcision is a token that you will cut off the foreskin of every male in Israel, but also to those that are foreigners that are in Israel. If they're going to be unto God and they're in Israel, they have to be circumcised. All the servants and the son's servants that are in Israel have to be circumcised. That is part of the covenant of God with Israel. Zechariah knows it. He's sitting there. Elizabeth knows it. She is from the tribe of Aaron, just in case you didn't know. So we've got someone, these two people know the Bible, they know the Old Testament, they're doing circumcision right. They're not just doing it for the health of the boy, they're doing it because it's a token of the covenant of God with Abraham. 
That's all they know. So God is showing the people that are in the audience, wow, look at this. Mother says no, she's following God's prophetic plan. It's perfect. It's perfect. And it says there in verse number 61, there is none of thy kindred, so they have doubts. Verse number 62, they made signs to his father how he was. And then Zechariah comes in and goes, hey, let me tell you what's going on there. That's in the second half of this in a moment. You see, in this moment, prophecy is fulfilled. Go back to Malachi chapter number 3 real quick. Malachi 3, for you and your electric Bibles, bam, you're there. But for you with your old-fashioned Bible, it's only a few pages. It's on page 18, 1184. 1,184, that's the page you got. It says in verse number 1, chapter number 3, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Prophecy fulfilled. Bam! This is a beautiful moment. How about the prophecy when you go back to chapter number 1 of Luke, and you see everything that Gabriel said. Gabriel said in the very first verses, the very, very beginning of Luke's gospel... Hey, Zechariah, he saw the angel. He fell. He was troubled. He tells him, we read it earlier, this is what's going to happen. You're going to have a son. He's going, no way. He's full of fear. He's full of doubt. He's full of just, he's not being a faithful man as he ought to be. While the neighbors and the cousins, they come out to rejoice. They're so happy. (laughs) And we discover that the forerunner of Jesus Christ is everything that he, God, said he's going to be. And Zechariah comes around here in a little bit to say that I agree. The second thing I see real quick in part of our first half of this text is this. A soldier is born, the second half of this in verses 63 down through 66, is that the people witnessed John's profound naming as he was separated unto God's holy calling. You got God's perfect plan and God's holy calling. How often do we get in the way of God's perfect plan and God's holy calling? You say, sometimes I don't even know that I'm getting in the way of it. Well, if it's something that's lining up with Scripture and you go going against the Scripture, that's a good way to determine it. Well, does it say something in the Scripture about things? That means that we have to be in the Bible a little more. We need to take it upon ourselves. If not, then you make maybe an appointment with one of the pastors or maybe someone who's discipled you, maybe someone who knows the Word of God a little more and say, can I sit down with you? There's many wonderful Bible teachers, men and women in our church that can sit down with you and walk through some things and say, okay, is this God's perfect plan? Well, let's look in Scripture and pray through it. Is this God's holy calling for me? Well, I don't know. Is it? Well, see, clearly in John's life, we know this is a fulfillment of prophecy, so he is a fulfillment of prophecy. Gabriel even spoke of all that they were supposed to do, and even in that short little time of just a few months, who Zechariah is quiet. Zechariah hasn't spoken a word. Nine months. A woman's dream if she's married. Nine months. Your husband hasn't said a word. Or maybe some of you are waiting, I wish he would start talking to me. And he's probably saying, let me sign language to you. God told me not to talk to you. No, that's not true. That's not right. I don't know how many of you here are Zechariah. I don't know. Zechariah is a priestly guy who was in the temple and was met by an angel. Pretty powerful setting there, and he is very quiet. But then we see how God's holy calling is unfolded. Look at verse 63 again. He writes down the name, John. What's the reaction? They marveled. Verse 64, he starts speaking. His tongue's loosed. He spake and praised God. What's the reaction? Verse 65, fear came on all that dwelt round about. Wow. What else do they do? And they all, these sayings, noise abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. Wow. Remember, Mary went to see Elizabeth in this area in verse 39. Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country in haste into a city of Judah. The city of Judah at that time, at that time, was maybe, they say, a hundred people. 
maybe a little bigger, small town that she's living in. But they went out and cried out about everything that happened with Zechariah the priest, who's quiet. And then all of a sudden, he can speak nine months later. And he says, this is the name. His name is going to be John, which means Jehovah showeth favor. Whoever's named John here, Jehovah's shown favor on your life. Very simply, God is gracious. God is gracious. Consider this man not being named Zecharias, but being named John, because Angel Gabriel, from the mouth of God, came and delivered the message to Zecharias and Elizabeth, and they held to God's word. And then fear came upon the people. They marveled at the name. The fear came upon them because all of a sudden there's a miracle, and now he can speak. And in this setting, look at verse number 66. After they noised the whole thing all around the hill country of Judea, verse 66, and all they that heard them laid Laid them up in their hearts, saying, This is their conclusion of all that's going on there. What manner of trial shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with them. I bet you many of you pray that for your children. Many of you pray that for children of First Bible. Maybe some of you will pray that for some of the young people going off to camp. If you study the hand of God on somebody, it's very rare for you to see that in the Bible. This is a powerful, powerful, powerful statement right here made by only the cousins and the neighbors and all that are gathered that are marveled, that fear the Lord of all that's going on in this setting over just a few minutes of the son being circumcised, being named John, and now, bam, it's kind of like you going to a conference. It's kind of like you going to a revival meeting. It's like kind of going to an Acts 1A conference and going, God, I didn't expect you to speak to me like this, but now God has made you, confronted by him and something he's telling you. It's a God defining moment. This is a defining moment for people. They're looking at this going, oh no! A soldier is born! And John's profound naming reveals that he is separated unto God's holy calling. That's this guy. That's this incredible guy. So let's look at the second half of this. Half time. Here we go now, second half, third quarter, here we go. Verse number 67, this is when Zechariah starts talking. This is incredibly cool because just like when Mary started speaking and giving glory to God, he does the same. He's blessing God. He's praising God. There's so much good stuff that goes on here. Let's break it down here. Verse number 67, in his father Zechariah, John's father, Remember the context of all this. It says he's filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, very simply, he's being controlled by the Holy Spirit. That's all. That's all it's saying. Well, what kind of measure of filling, and did he get a special filling? Could he lay hands on? No. The Bible's just simply saying the Holy Spirit is controlling him in terms of what he's saying. How do you know that? Because it's all Scripture that he's about to speak. From the Old Testament, God's promises, and now for what God has for this man to say to all of them right there. He says in verse 68, let me read the whole thing down. Just capture what he's saying. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, the Davidic covenant. Verse 70, and as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets which have been since the world began, how God spoke by his holy prophets, verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies, that Israel will be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him in all the days of our life. He's speaking of all of them, of the nation of Israel, of Jews, that the Messiah is being brought to them. The Messiah is being delivered. In fact, he was in on Elizabeth and Mary visiting just a few weeks ago, three months back. His wife is six months pregnant. Mary shows up. They have a visit that turns into worship, and he has heard everything that Mary 
I mean, how would he know? It's a fulfillment of the prophecy that God put in the Old Testament. Psalms, Genesis 22, the, Abra- excuse me, the, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel chapter number 7. Remember we preached through that just a couple years ago. Consider that this man here, as he's speaking and blessing God, he's speaking God's word as a praise. Verse 76, now he talks about his son, but then moves it to talking about his son to talk about the son of the Most High, Jesus Christ. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, a new life in Christ, the light of the Lord, the light of the, the world. Verse 79, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Zechariah is saying what the Gospel of John says in Gospel of John chapter number 1, that Jesus is the light of the world and John is talking about the light coming, capital L. Zechariah, he's saying it in the audience of an eight-year-old, I mean an eight-day-year-old. An eight-day-year-old? What is that? How about an eight-day-old? This is not as easy as it looks up here. I just want you to know. (laughs) Better check my blood pressure. Now look at verse 80, because you know Luke's writing verse 80 from a place of being the witness by the Holy Spirit, and it's later on, because it's not in the same setting as what Zechariah has said in that setting. Verse number 80, And the child grew and waxed strong in the Spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel, until he came out of the wilderness and the deserts and started saying, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. He's coming. You see, again, the Gospel of Luke's incredible. When you read this little benediction, this statement of Zechariah, and then you end with verse number 80, you're, you're really quickly just transported in this thinking, I need to praise God. I need to use the scripture to praise God. People say, well, sometimes I just, I sing or I pray or I just read a psalm and then I pray. There's no greater way to me. Read some psalms. This is a song. This is a benediction. This is a declaration by Zechariah. And Luke records it and it's in the word of God. He's saying, this is my blessing or God, you be blessed. Have you blessed God recently? Or have you been praying, God, please bless my life? Zechariah is blessing God. This is powerful. So, let me walk through these. These are all really simple. It's a breakdown of the scripture of the passage really quickly. Follow along with me. The first one is this. A soldier is still being born here. And that's the reflection or the headline. The first thing is about praise. Praise. Verses number 67 and 68, look at it this way. A soldier is born. His Holy Spirit-filled father. This is John's father, Zacharias. He blessed Yahweh. He blessed the Old Testament God of Israel. Look at verse 68. He blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. This Spirit-filled man, being controlled by God, is blessing the God of the old covenant for his visit and for his redemption for Israel. Why? Because he knows, again, who is in the tummy of Mary. He knows that he is only the prophet. He is only the teacher, the preacher, the man. He is not the man. He is not Jesus. And he knows that, and so he's stating it clearly Zechariah is saying, hey, John's coming, he's my son, he will be John the Baptist, but Jesus Christ from Zechariah's lips is saying, hey, thank you, Lord God of Israel, for you have visited and redeemed your people. You prophesied it, and you said you would, and so I praise you for that. He first praises for John, his son, and second of all, for Jesus Christ. Be reminded in verses number 30 through 33, of how the angel Gabriel spoke to Mary. And so Mary recounted it when she came to see Elizabeth. And she said, hey, 
I'm going to give birth to a son, and his name's going to be Jesus, and he will be the son of the highest, the Lord God Almighty. When a soldier is born, we realize (coughs) that God is saying, look, you're according to my prophecy fulfilled. You are separated unto my holy calling. And now, practically speaking, when Zechariah starts speaking, he is speaking again of praise unto God. This man had doubt and fear and faithfulness, and now we see him. He transitions into a place of truly being a man of faith, a man of obedience, a man of confidence. Zechariah praised God for redeeming his people. The second thing I want you to see is in verses 69 through 75. We move right along in this passage. We've read it. Now let's just kind of determine what God is saying. Verse 69, he raised up a horn of salvation. The word in that text is meaning very simply strength or power. God is saying, hey, in his Old Testament statements that Zechariah is now recounting, that God has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. I mentioned it earlier. He is really truly referencing the Davidic covenant. Verse 70, And as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, who spoke to David? Nathan the prophet. He delivered the covenant of God to David. It was a precursor for the fulfillment of that covenant when Jesus Christ would be sent, the Messiah. So what happens here? Very simply, his Holy Spirit-filled Father alluded to God's salvation, mercy, deliverance by his oath. Everything that God had promised, Zechariah is putting out before the people in his blessed statement. I wonder, again, sometimes as soldiers of the Lord, if we really are to be soldiers of the Lord, do we talk about God enough? Do we talk about his promises being fulfilled enough? Do we talk about, well, listen, just witnessing to people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I need to get the Romans road down. There's so much more. Talk to people about what God has done in your life. Talk to people about, like Zechariah is doing, how God has come through in promise after promise after promise. That's how you build that beautiful witness as a soldier, as a warrior. You're championing the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you talk about God's mercy. You talk about his deliverance. You talk about his salvation. I know this is specifically talking to the nation of Israel. And he's talking about how, hey, guess what? In verse 71 and 72, God came through. He saved them from his enemies. He delivered them so, as he promised to the fathers. And he remembered his holy covenant. God never forgot his oath that he swore to Father Abraham back in Genesis 22, as I mentioned earlier, that he said he would send the sacrifice, the salvation, the horn of our salvation, which David writes in Psalm 18. You see, this all comes together clearly when you and I go, wow, when a soldier is born, the Holy Spirit-filled Father speaks of praises and he speaks of promises, and this is a great challenge for us. We have the whole Word of God in front of us, and we could be praising God a little bit more. We could be talking to people more about promises, and it all fits beautiful to being a soldier on this 4th of July weekend. The third thing I want you to see is verses 76 through 79. A soldier is born. His Holy Spirit-filled father declared his son's ministry to prophesy the coming of Jesus Christ. I love this because I said it earlier and just reading it through. His father is saying, I know you're the preparer. I know you're the one that's preparing the way. And he talks about his ministry for one verse. But then he starts talking about the Lord. He says in verse number 76, And thou, child... (laughs) Thou child, how old's the child? He's eight days old. He's been named John, and he's telling him, this is what you're going to do, son. Do you think it was the only time he told him? I think not. I think this is a beautiful setting of how us as older into the younger, we just had Father's Day, we just had Mother's Day back in May. We just got to think about what we're talking to our children about and our grandchildren and how you're counting on, brothers and sisters of the Lord as parents, you're counting on us to be talking to your children about the same things that you're talking to them about. Thou child shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of sins. So now he says, hey, you're going to talk about Jesus. 
and the knowledge of salvation. You're talking about Jesus and the remission of sin. You're talking about Jesus and God's incredible tender mercy by his son. You're going to talk about Jesus and how he's the day spring of the sunrise. You're going to talk about Jesus because in verse number 79 it says, to give light to them that sit in darkness. That's who you're going to be, John. That's what you've got to be doing because you're separated unto God and his is holy calling. You are Jehovah showeth favor. This is who you are, John, and this is what you're going to be doing. And as he focuses on John's ministry, I ask you, parents, older to younger, are you focusing on what your children's ministry is going to be, or are you more focused on their education? Which is good. you you got to have the kid get some smarts, yes? Are you focusing on what ministry they may have one day? Because that's what this parent's doing. You'll be the one who will prepare the way so the people that are prepared to hear will know that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by him. (coughs) Lastly, the soldier is born, and he is preferred, but he points to the one that's really preferred. You see, God preferred John the Baptist in this particular calling, but we find out later in Luke's gospel that Jesus Christ said that there's no one greater, but those that are in the kingdom of God are even more. Those that are in Jesus are even more than who John was. We'll get to that in a few months. You see, the Holy Spirit-filled Father completed John's notice. Here's your notice. Here's your notice and declaration of your assignment with a strong character reference. You're preferred. God, God's called you. <clears throat> you're preferred, but it's for the assignment that you're going to do, not necessarily because you're a wonderful, wonderful kid. So the statement that Luke makes in verse number 80 comes from Zechariah's witness of what kind of kid he was because Luke wasn't there to find out what kid he was. It says the child grew. Yeah, he grew. And what did he become? Rebellious? Difficult? No. Verse number 80 tells me he waxed strong in spirit. Oh, what a great trait to have for a young girl and a young boy. Strong in spirit. But God's spirit. And was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. That's quite a preparation right there. But when he was prepared, he was unleashed. He didn't stay in the desert that long because he was a man crying in the wilderness about Jesus Christ. John had a following, but he moved his following to the following of the one whose name is Jesus. You see, that's the way that we are to be as God's set apart, called out vessels to be used as gospel messengers. That's the way our young people are to be. That's the way our teenagers, that's the way our youth pastor goes about things in youth group. When you get your kids into youth group or they're in their name now, I promise you one thing, that pastor is all about primed. He wants to see the kids know about the seed and the soil and the sower. He wants that ground to be one that is so beautiful that it receives the seed of the Word of God. That's the way we ought to be. This is John preparing the ground for the light of the world to come. And that's why I put up here for our visit, I mean for our invitation time, there may be some soldiers, I said it earlier, that were born a few years ago And they're going to camp. They're going to prime summer camp. So let's pray for them. Let's pray for them. Why don't you stand? I'm going to pray with you for about a minute. Music is going to start in the background. Let's make this a time of prayer for young men and women that maybe were born soldiers a long time ago and God's going to get a hold of them at camp please make sure you grab a couple of these bracelets.
as we take this time and invitation. Our Father in heaven, what a time we've had in your beautiful word. Thank you for the 24 verses about this man, simply put, John the Baptist. Thank you for his birth. Thank you for Zechariah speaking. Thank you, God, for Elizabeth in this setting. Thank you for the naming of John and for the calling out that you made, a separate holy calling that you made for his life, and how God now it applies and transports all the way here 2,000 years later to us. I pray for this time in the name of Jesus for this church, for the young people going off to summer camp, that God, you will do a precious and mighty and powerful work that they will know about the praises of you. They will know the promises of you. They will understand that, God, you have something for them. Maybe it's just simply the purpose of being a soldier for Jesus Christ. I pray that you will bless this time that we have in prayer in Jesus' name. Please come.